In our previous episode on Daenerys Targaryen, we detailed the taking of Marine and the Queen's decision to remain with her people in Slaver's Bay rather than immediately embark upon reclaiming her birthright. In ruling this city, the apparent last of the Targaryens would have her mettle as a ruler severely tested, with her kind nature constantly thwarting her ability to take drastic and decisive action where it was needed. In this episode, we will discuss the trials, tribulations and consequences that followed Daenerys' initial attempt to break the wheel and conclude the last of the Targaryen story until the events of Winds of Winter. Following their founding as a militia hell-bent on deposing Daenerys' rule, the Sons of the Harpy remained unrelenting, offering a hundred slave girls to anyone who could bring them the silver-haired head of the city's ruler. This was not the end of their promises, for suffering was to be dished out to any who supported what the nobles deemed unfair occupation of their city. As the murders continued apace, Daenerys' kind heart again got in the way as she found herself unable to harm the hostages she had taken from the city's noble families to deter the Sons of the Harpy, even if it might stop the attacks. Instead, she founded three more companies of freedmen, the Stalwart Shields, the Mother's Men and the Free Brothers, who were all charged with defending the city from the Harpies. While most of Marine's nobility despised her, some of the city's upper crust still supported her. This faction came to be known as Shavepates, a group who, as we mentioned in the previous episode, had been targeted by the Sons of the Harpy due to their loyalties. To display their support for the Queen, these men renounced the Giscari culture of old by shaving their heads and abandoning their traditional hairstyle. Moreover, their leader, Skahaz Mokandak, also served as a counsellor to Daenerys. To further complicate matters in a politically chaotic city, the Queen's dragons had grown wilder, hunting and slaughtering sheep in the hinterlands outside of Marine's walls. Daenerys compensated the shepherds for their losses. However, when another herder presented the burned bones of his daughter, Isaiah, Daenerys's hand was forced. Viserion and Rhaegal were imprisoned in a pit below the Great Pyramid, where they could do no more harm. Drogon escaped this attempted containment, flying towards the Dothraki Sea. As the burdens of rule continued to mount upon Daenerys' back, the last scion of old Valyria was visited by a vision of Quaithe as she slept, who warned her of more significant dangers to come. Soon comes the pale mare, and after her the others, Kraken and Dark Flame, Lion and Griffin, the Sun's Son and the Mummer's Dragon. Trust none of them. Remember the undying. Beware the perfumed Seneschal. A merchant prince of Karth, Zaro Zoan Daxos, offered Daenerys a solution to her ongoing problems, proposing to give her 13 ships, which her people could use to depart for Westeros immediately. However, as soon as the Queen realized that her freedmen would have to be left behind, she refused the offer outright. At this point in her reign, all she had strived to build was on the verge of being toppled. In Yunkai, slavery had resumed, and the wise masters had re-established an army comprised of slave levies and sellswords, complemented by their allies in New Geese, who sent the formidable Iron Legions to aid them. With all this new manpower, they set their sights on restoring the Old World Order in Astapor. With an army approaching his gates, King Cleon scrambled to prepare for the onslaught, with Daenerys predictably offering him no aid. As a result, he was defeated at the Horns of Hazat, with his poorly trained and inexperienced new Unsullied scattered and slaughtered during a wild and uncoordinated retreat to Astapor. Daenerys regretted not lending her aid, yet Marine would undoubtedly have fallen to the Harpies in her absence if she had. Cleon the Great, as he had begun to style himself, was assassinated by his soldiers. His successor, Cleon II, would only survive eight days on the throne before having his throat cut. He was succeeded by his killer, a former barber known appropriately as King Cutthroat. Cutthroat subsequently surrendered the city, allowing the besiegers to put most of its population to the sword, while Cutthroat himself was thrown into a pit where a pack of rabid dogs killed him. After the sack of Astapor, the Yonkish set their eyes on Marine, 
and began a march upon the city along the coast road, which placed Daenerys under immense pressure. Galaza Galare, the high priestess of the town, counseled that to appease the nobles of Slaver's Bay, Daenerys should marry a noble of the city. The gentleman Hizdar Zolorek was identified as the most eligible bachelor. An agreement between the two was quickly hashed out, with Hizdar being told that if he could stop the murders committed by the Sons of the Harpy within 90 days, he would earn the Queen's hand in marriage. This bargain was made against the wishes of Sir Barristan, who vehemently opposed it. Not long after, Dario Naharis returned to the city, and good tidings came with the Sellsword's homecoming. Negotiations with the Lazarine had been successful, and the peaceful shepherd people would now trade with Marine. When Daenerys asked Dario his opinion on her arranged marriage, the ever pragmatic leader of the Stormcrows suggested that the marriage ceremony should be used as a pretense to bring together the nobility and execute them en masse. Revolted by his Machiavellian instincts, Daenerys sent his Stormcrows back out of the city to guard the Kezai Pass. The situation went from bad to worse for Daenerys when ships from Karth, Tolos, and New Gis blockaded the harbour of Marine. Lacking a navy of her own, Daenerys' followers were unable to dislodge the blockade. In slightly gladder tidings, it seemed as if Hisdar had managed to put a stop to the murders within the city. However, this success generated suspicions that Hisdar was a son of the Harpy all along. Meanwhile, Astapuri refugees had made their way to the town. Since many of them were infected with the bloody flux, Daenerys was forced to make them camp outside the city's walls, so they would not contaminate the people within. Hisdar's diplomatic efforts continued when he contacted the Yunkai, who offered a peace that required tribute from the Targaryens and an agreement that Yunkai and Astapor would return to their former status as slaver cities without her interference an agreement contingent upon Daenerys and Hisdar's marriage. After this, Dario returned to the town again, bringing news that the second sons had defected to Yunkai. The Yunkai force now consisted of four sellsword companies, Tolosi slingers, Carthine camelry, and six iron legions of new geese. With the immense stress of the situation bearing heavily upon her, Daenerys gave in to her urges and took Dario as her lover. A mere day before her wedding to Hisdar, Dario introduced the Mother of Dragons to the Windblown, who had defected to their side. One man among them revealed himself as Quentin Martell, the Prince of Dawn. Quentin had brought with him a signed wedding pact to marry his sister, the Dornish Princess Ariane, to Daenerys' brother Viserys. Upon learning Viserys was in fact dead, Quentin offered his hand in marriage to Daenerys. In an attempt to keep her earlier promises, Daenerys rejected the proposal out of hand, and instead married Hisdar. Hisdar then invited the captains of the Yunkish army into the city to celebrate the peace treaty and the reopening of the fighting pits, with Miranese hostages being sent to the Yunkish camp to ensure the Yunkish captain's safety, with Daenerys despising the entire ordeal. The queen attempted to convince Quentin Martell to return home for his safety while visiting her dragons, before making her way to Desnak's pit for the festivities. As the celebrations at the pit commenced, everything went south incredibly quickly. Wishing for Daenerys to try some of the local cuisines, Hisdar urged Daenerys to try a Miranese delicacy, locusts. These insects were instead consumed by the bottomless pit that was Belwes, who promptly dropped to his knees and began to evacuate the contents of his stomach, revealing that the locusts had been poisoned. At that exact moment, Drogon swooped into the pit to eat the body of a fallen pit fighter, which caused panic in the crowd. One man fired a spear at the dragon, which prompted Daenerys to rush to his side, mount him, and fly from the arena. This flight caused many to fear that Daenerys had died, and chaos broke out in the city. However, she remained very much alive. Drogon had brought her to the Dothraki Sea, but would no longer listen to her commands. As such, she began the long walk back to Marine. During this trek, she fell ill, retching and suffering from diarrhea, suffering a fever dream of Viserys, before finally being able to recall Drogon to her side. At this point, the Kalasar of Kal Jako came upon both dragon and rider. Back in Marine, 
The chaos that had engulfed the city resulted in an unlikely alliance between Sir Barristan, Grey Worm, and Scahers. Barristan was infuriated by what he deemed to be a plot by his da to assassinate Daenerys. However, he did not act against his da, believing that in the absence of the queen, it was not his place to make such decisions. However, the grandfatherly Barristan's anger came to a boiling point when Bloodbeard, the leader of the Company of the Cat, informed him that one of the Myrinese hostages had been executed. Barristan, alongside the brazen beasts, reacted by arresting his da, slaying the massive and imposing pit fighter Kraz in the process. Unfortunately, despite Barristan having urged Quentin to leave the city for his own sake, the Dornishman attempted to tame one of Daenerys's dragons and was mortally wounded by dragonfire, with Rhaegal and Viserion escaping as a result of the Martell Prince's folly. Faced with enemies on all fronts, Barristan was forced to assume the role of Hand of the Queen. A council session was then called, where the plan for the city's defence was decided upon. Matters were complicated when the news was brought to Sir Barristan that the Junkish catapults had begun flinging corpses into the town, infected with the bloody flux. Ordinarily, Sir Barristan would have defended the city from behind its stout walls, yet for this fight, he made the bold choice to ride out and meet the besiegers in the field, rather than watch the pale mare bring Marine to its knees. As a result, Barristan assembled the forces available to him. On the evening before the offensive took place, he gave a speech to the newly anointed knights he had been training in the city up until this point. Then, at the coming of the dawn, Barristan ordered the attack. This brings us up to date with the tale of Daenerys Targaryen at the time of writing. However, we remain hopeful that the winds of winter will bring us to the culmination of the second Siege of Marine in due time. However, this is a story for another day, and the next few videos in this series will return us to the shores of Westeros and the continued struggle for the Iron Throne. We're planning to cover the battles of many other fantasy, sci-fi and space opera universes, so make sure you have subscribed and press the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing as it helps immensely, and don't forget to comment. We'll try to read and respond to every comment as we want to know what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.